in the name of God Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful. Under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE, the ruler of Dubai. And along with the annual event of the Dubai International Holy Quran Awards, we would like to welcome you to this lecture today in this holy and blessed month of faith and worship, Ramadan. Our lecturer tonight is an American Muslim, preacher and teacher, born in 1944, who converted from Christianity to Islam in 1991. He was a Muslim chaplain for the United States Bureau of Prison through the 1990s, as well as a Muslim delegate to the United Nations World Peace Conference for Religious Leaders held in the United Nations in September 2000. Active in Islamic missionary work in the United States and worldwide, he is often featured as guest presenter and keynote speaker at, at various Islamic events and conferences, as well as frequently appearing on various satellite TV channels, such as Peace TV and Huda TV. He is also the founder of a free-to-air internet and satellite TV channel called Guide Us TV. He had produced a couple of video presentation series, such as Arabic and English, which is designed to help English speakers learn the Arabic language easily using his teaching method, and Qisasul Anbiya, Stories of the Prophets, aimed towards English-speaking children of Muslim parents. Presently, he was nominated for and awarded the Islamic Personality of the Year by the 16th Dubai International Holy Quran Award, and we hereby take this opportunity to congratulate Sheikh Yusuf Estes on this occasion and ask God Almighty, the Glorious and Most High, to continue to make him a means of benefit to Islam and the Muslim nation. And before starting the lecture, I would like to grab your attention that Sheikh Yusuf Estes will be delivering a speech tomorrow after Jum'ah prayer, inshallah, in Sheikh Hamdan Mosque in Garhud. And now, we would like to, to invite Sheikh Yusuf Estes to deliver his speech, Bridge to Faith as Way for Salvation. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala ali wa sabi ajma'in Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu wa muhammadin abduhu wa rasul Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa ramadan mubarak MashaAllah Look at all these beautiful smiling faces at 10 o'clock What is it, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock at night, these guys are smiling They must have ate a lot of food, huh? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Hu Allah, the Jamal Muslimin, and it's very good to be with all of you here tonight. You want to do Tajma? Don't need Tajma? No, I was speaking Texan, actually. <laughs> I don't either. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, it's great to be with all of you here again in this very same place where we were last night, and what a wonderful experience it was last night to go through this ceremony because it showed something. It showed the creativity, imagination, and vision of this entire country and especially of Dubai. I was very impressed and I had a lot of comments about this today. I wish I had more time on the internet. I've been busy today. This morning, the first thing we did, we went to the big library here where they preserve the books. The most amazing of all places, you know this one, right? You know this is special because they preserve the manuscripts and old books. You know who I mean? You know, we've got to take you tomorrow, that you'll find out. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. And then after that we went to the Sijin. Now most Muslims are trying to get away from the Sijin, yeah? We went to the Sijin. What is Sijin? Sijin, a prison, exactly. See, you said you didn't know how to translate. Look how you're doing all of the mashallah. Yes, jail, prison. We went to prison. Yeah. But for me, this is normal because I spent many years in America as the national Muslim chaplain. 
especially for institutions which means the military as a volunteer and as a paid volunteer for the Bureau of Prisons and that's in Washington DC can you imagine what it was like in America because we have so many people incarcerated in the United States when I started as a chaplain we had approximately one million people in jail when I left there was more than two million two million and at a cost of over forty thousand dollars a year for each one hmm? so much so that many private organizations are putting together places to take the prisoners they're building their own prison private prison you can understand private prison <laughs> and subhanallah when you compare it to what we saw today it's amazing because here the idea is not to punish it is not to hurt somebody to kick him around but rather to change his outlook to change his mind to correct you know what Allah said in the Quran right that Allah doesn't change the condition of the people until the people change themselves and look how and this is amazing I didn't see something like this look how that they work with this first of all they keep a record of each thing like the library at the prison they have it so you can check out a book but when you do you must return the book and say something about the book say something about the book and I read it and more than one he said I read this book it helped me it changed my outlook and one of them he even said and I, and I was so surprised I even afraid you saw me I said look at read this because he said after I read this book I'm understanding about myself I did a big mistake he said in February of 2007 I was fighting to defend myself with somebody and I killed him he said it's my mistake he didn't say oh self-defense I'm trying no he said I made a mistake and this is very important in psychology to know when you made a mistake you have to admit it you can't just keep going no it's his fault no her she did it no he no uh, uh, you know and I was explaining to the inmates about the blame gun have you heard about the blame gun I'm from Texas everybody has to have a gun in Texas right kind of like Afghanistan anyway <laughs> Boom. Huh? Blame. 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 I blame you. I blame you. And blame, blame, blame. That's why I call it a blame. It sounds like a gun, doesn't it? You blaming somebody. But in Islam, you don't blame, do you? It's actually a form of shirk. Rasulullah compared it to a black ant on a black rock on a black night. Can you see it? No. But this kind of thing will be just that kind of shirt making partners with Allah because it means you're not happy you're not satisfied with what Allah gave you so subhanallah when I saw the way that they were operating that prison there today and the way I was received the way that they treated the prisoners I said man this is this is amazing they said yes we have five-star prison five-star because if you memorize even two Jews which is about one-sixteenth of the Qur'an, they will reduce your sentence by maybe one or two years. If you memorize the entire Qur'an, they will take off up to 20 years off of somebody's sentence. Suppose somebody's in for 22 years, huh? He can be out in two years, just memorize Qur'an. And we asked the one in charge about this subject. He said, you know, somebody asked me this question. They asked me, you mean anybody? He said, anybody. Even this not Muslim? He said, yes. He said, aren't you afraid he would come in, he would memorize the Quran and go back out and kill somebody else? He said, I have no problem. If he can memorize the Quran, if he understands the meaning of this, and he can go out and kill somebody, it'll be the first time. Never. Because it changes people. In America, the biggest problem we have, and the other person who works very closely with me in America also worked in prisons, Mutair Sabri. 
and you can ask him, ask me, we'll tell you. The biggest problem we have on a state level, federal level, county level, city level, when somebody gets out of jail, he's going to be right back in again. We call it a yo-yo. I don't know if you know what's a yo-yo. It's a toy that we use, the children use it. It goes down, it comes back. It goes down, it comes back. It's a yo-yo. They go out, they come back. They go out, they come back. So I asked him, okay, do you have this problem? He said, no. Very few ever come back. Why? Number one, they change the attitude. Number two, they give them something to hope for, something to believe in. Number three, they educate them. If he doesn't have education, it's provided free. And when he's educated, they also will train them and help them. And as we were leaving, he was telling us about a program. Instead of, they said, why don't you let them work inside the prison in an occupation? It's a very good idea. In America, they do that. But a lot of problems come with it. Contraband. People bring stuff in for them to <laughs> make other stuff. And when they do this, another problem comes in dealing in tijara, in business. You know, the guys who are bringing it in are trying to use them like Chinese labor. You know? No, he said, no, we just let them go out and work. I said, what? He said, no, we trust them. And you know what? It should be like that. If somebody's really improving, give him responsibility, but give him trust. He said he's very successful. The whole program that we watched there today, uh, as we were coming back, out of you know, we said it. This is amazing. How come we didn't hear about this in America? If they would see this, they could change many things. Well, the problem, the problem is our media. Our media is so involved with monetary gain that that becomes first. Does the story sell? If it doesn't sell, don't run it. Simple as that. If it's exciting, oh, somebody died. Oh, good. Put that up there. Somebody killed somebody. Put it up there. Yeah, that's what we need to hear about. Somebody did a good deed. They helped some people. I don't care about that. Don't put that in there. They don't need that either. So what I'm saying is that you and I, we need to be aware of this. Because in America, all we're hearing about Islam is what? What are we hearing? Do you know? I'll give you a clue. Take a microphone. Go up to somebody. Put the microphone to them and say, I'm going to give you a sentence. Give me the last word of the sentence. I did this. He said, okay. Just give me one word. I want the last word, okay? All Muslims are... Peaceful, nice, kind, no. Isn't that what they said? And another one. Islam is a good way to live, a deen, no. And why is because there's no voice showing the other side. How important is it for us to have a voice? Suppose right now, here tonight, that all of a sudden there was a problem up. What would happen? Think about that. Where are you today with no voice? And if you said, well, you know, I don't care about this modern technology stuff, I, I just want to go my way, I, I have my life, I have my job, you know, I don't need this. Facebook, haram. Hmm? Email, surfing the internet, haram. Hmm? Text message, stuff for Allah. I don't need this, I don't need this. Maybe you don't, but the rest of the world does. They need to hear from us. Who are we? What are we really all about? Let me share with you something. I, when I was with the inmates today, we had a really good time. Because when I'm with the inmates, I really have fun with them. I play with their head, you know. And I joke with them. And I let them understand that Islam is for everybody. Not just somebody sitting in a masjid. Not just somebody who's making tawaf around the Kaaba. No, this is for everybody all day long. And I was mentioning this story to them. Last month, 
well, just before Ramadan started, we were out in California, about a, maybe maybe June. While I was there, they had open house. Maybe not as many people as we have here today, but they had a lot of people. And in the open house, they had Christians and Jews. And it was interesting, the Christians and Jews, I don't know why, they were sitting all on one side, and the Jews were in the front row. And so I decided I'm going to make my focus on them tonight. By the way, I never plan a program. I don't. I don't. Because I want to let Allah show me what to say to the people in front of me. And subhanAllah, it came in my mind, ask them about the Sharia. Because it's a big subject. 37 states in the United States right now have laws that they've either implemented or they're voting on to stop anybody from practicing Sharia in America. A law, I'm going to show you what is the value of this statement. A law against Sharia. A law against what? Sharia. If you know the language, you just say, you like, what? How could it be? And I tested them. I said, guys, help me out here. I like words. That's one of my things is etymology. I think I'll be an etymologist, a person who studies words. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I said to them, a word. Tell me about this word. They said, okay, what word? I said, Sharia. You know the word? They said, yes, yes. I said, good or bad? They said, bad, bad. I said, evil? Evil. I said, okay. Another word, Torah. You know Torah? Right away, the Jewish, yes, we know Torah. Some Christians, yeah, we know Torah. Good or bad? They said, very good. I said, you just contradicted yourself. They said, what? Yes. These are the same word. One for the Old Testament and the other one for the New Testament. The last testament, which is the Quran. You know they have the Jewish Testament, Christian Testament, Muslim Testament. It's, it's the same God. It's the same thing. And look, and I began to compare the Ten Commandments to the commandments we know in Islam. Number one, La ilaha illallah. Don't have any other gods beside God. Number one, chapter 20 in the book of Exodus. Read it. They said, oh. And they're looking at each other, that's right, that's right. I said, this is number one. Number two, La Sharika Allah. Don't have any statues or images. They said, oh yeah. Number three, the asma wa safa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't take Allah's name in vain. He said, yeah, 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 that's right. Very good. Number four is about worship. Keep a day for worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, yes. Okay. And what's number five? They said, thou shalt not kill. Don't kill anybody. Huh? I said, no, it's not. Not in your book and not in our book. After your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, above everything else, take care of your parents. He said, what? Read your book. Number five, thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. And in Islam, the first thing after Allah, and this is hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you know it better than me. And they ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who after Allah and his messenger has the most haq, the most rights on me? He said, your mother. Huh? After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after the worship to Allah and following his messenger, you're telling me the next verse, most important thing, obey my mother? Yeah. And then what? Your mother. Huh? And then what? Your mother. Huh? And then? And then your father. Mother. 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 Then your father. Then it says don't kill somebody. This is Quran. Same God, same law, same Sharia, same Torah, but you said they're different. And the people sat there and went, uh, uh, We didn't know. I said, You know why you didn't know? It's not your fault. It's our fault because we didn't tell you. We're sitting here like this, very quiet. Even we'll go like this. And then as soon as we're by ourselves, and then as soon as somebody, not Muslim, come up, oh. then this has to change. If we are going to survive in the world today, why do you think something like Syria, you know, Syria right now is a big problem. Remember in the problems they had in Libya and Afghanistan. Oh, there was a lot of problems they did to themselves. I have no doubt. The Muslims did a lot of stupid things to themselves. But 
what happened from outside also comes back to us. You know why? Because we did not get the message out. Simple as that. Yes or no? Did we do a good job? Did we get the message out? People know what's Islam or no? Ask yourself. Is it a problem? And in America, in America, I actually heard big shiyukh say this. We do not need another masjid. The first time I heard that, I went, why? I said, we have to worship Allah. They said, no, we don't need another masjid. We don't need another madrasa. We don't need another mosque or place to worship. We don't need another school. You know what we need? We need our voice. This is what we need. Forget about a masjid. Well, because look what just happened yesterday. Yesterday. Do you know what happened yesterday? What happened? They burned down a masjid in America. And this day, Friday, it's, it's Friday over here now, we're supposed to be, Guidance TV is supposed to be in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, because that's where they had the other masjid problem that they burnt that one down when they were trying to build it. Because today is the grand opening. They finally allowed them to open it. They had to have a court ruling to overthrow the judge's ruling against Islam. Now, how does this set with you? One masjid is get, finally getting the right to open, and at the same time, they're burning down another one. And what happened just a few days before that? And it didn't even happen to Muslims. It happened to the poor Sikh. The Sikh people. You know what happened? A guy used to be in the military, went out to their temple and started shooting and killing them. And they came and the police killed him. But by the way, he wasn't a terrorist because he wasn't a Muslim. This is the part where you're supposed to clap. You didn't know that? Give him the cue card. Help him out. Okay. Anyhow. <laughs> but seriously, guys, we have to wake up. This is a very important thing. And as far as talking about the prison, and that had a big impact on me today. I'm so glad you took me there. I'm even more glad you got me out. Yeah, by the way, these jokes won't get any better if you don't laugh louder. All right, that, that, thank you very much. <laughs> that was nice. That's called a mercy laugh. Anyhow. <laughs> Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, Adunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. How many of you heard this hadith before? Raise your hand. You heard it? How many of you would like to know the meaning? What does that mean? You want to know? Okay. Sijin means a prison. Dunya means this worldly life that we live in. Jannah means paradise. Kafir means a disbeliever. So this worldly place that we live in is actually a prison for a true believer. But it's the only paradise for a disbeliever. Why? Let's analyze it. And we did that in the prison today, didn't we? We talked to him about that. What's the first thing that you notice when you're in prison? You can't go where you want to go. Isn't that true? You can't be with the ones you love. Isn't that true? And after that, you can't wear the kind of clothes you want to wear, can you? Huh? A snappy suit. Can you imagine going and say, Warden, do you have something in a little bit bigger size? I would also like the pinstripe, the new one that's the Louis Vuitton, which is good. No. No doesn't work like that. You get the same color orange as everybody else. So forget the clothes. This is the same for Muslims, by the way. Now watch. The food in the prison. Imagine. Do they give you a little list in the morning you can check up? I'll have T-bone steak. No, oh no, the ribs. I want the ribs today. I'll have... Uh, is this how it works in prison? No, I don't think so. You get the same goulash that ever, you know, like, uh, it's not even umali. It's more like uh, baba ganoush. <laughs> That's it. Yeah? By the way, before I leave this subject, I, let me, I need a fatwa real quick and then I'll come back to my subject. Check, maybe you know the answer. Yeah, we need a fatwa. If umali, you know the d dessert, the delicious, and she's over here on the table and baba ganoush is over here, does she have to wear a hijab or no? Well, while you think about it, we'll go back to the subject. 
<laughs> now he got it. <laughs> we'll come back to the subject though. Look at the condition of the believer. A real believer in a law. If you read and study the Quran, you find the real objective of this life is not to go get killed and get 72 virgins in paradise. In fact, it doesn't even say that. The real objective of this life is to be with God in paradise. Yes or no? To see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It mentioned in the Quran. This is the objective to be with God, to be with the prophets, to be with Jesus and Muhammad and Suleiman and all the prophets. We want to be with them. Yes or no? This is our objective. How did these people twist this story to something else? Allahu Akbar! Ajib! This is too amazing! Isn't it true in prison you can't be with the ones you love and go and come as you please? But in paradise you will! You will be able to enjoy to the maximum and you can be with Allah. You can be with the Prophet. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, you can be in the highest paradise. Jannatul Firdaus wa ala may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us that. Ameen. Good Ameen. Yeah, man. I want to be there. You do too. I want all of us to be there. All of us. But we're not. We're suffering. We have problems. You have pain. You have agony. You're uncomfortable. Huh? Every day we have different problems, don't we? Especially, you're fasting. You get a little bit hungry, huh? <laughs> We'd like to have a drink. <laughs> Yeah, be nice, a little bit of water, can't, sun's out, true or false. This is because where we live, this is decision for us. It's not hell, no way, but it's still like a prison. So it's a good comparison, wasn't it? The clothes, the food, the drink, and not being with one of you love. But what about the other side of the story? When he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, that it's the only paradise for somebody who disbelieves. For the one who doesn't believe in God, they don't believe in the next life, what do they have to live for? If they don't believe, what do they have to live for? Nothing except this life. Get a bigger car, get a bigger house. Huh? Get a better job. Get a better position in life. Get a bigger rank. Hey, you know who I am? Huh? <laughs> and then what? Imagine this, and Allah gives you this story about the Mufata, is that the plural of Mufta? Mufta. One key. Are you sure? Fati? Many keys, yeah? In Quran, the one he has all the keys. So many keys it would load down. Men can't carry all the keys to his treasure. How did, yes, how did he wind up? Good or bad? He sunk, Karun. Yeah, he sunk all the way to his neck. And then the, peop the people were saying, we want to be like him, until Allah made him in the neck. And he said, we don't want to be like him. <laughs> think about this. Even yourself. Forget about this. Just think about yourself. You have a key to your house? You have a key to your car? Is it in your purse? Is it in your pocket? Do you have it with you? Put it in your hand right now. Go ahead. Put it in your hand and hold it. Hold it tight so somebody can't steal it. Grab it. Get it in your hand. This is my keys. <laughs> Nobody can get my keys, right? The minute Malakal Mot, the angel of death, comes for your roof, for your soul, and you die, a baby can walk over and open your fingers and take out your keys. And you can do nothing. So what was this life worth? For all oh, that money you had in the bank. Remember that savings box you had and you had it all uh, and the treasures and the gold and the... They're not going to put that in the grave with you, are they? Huh? Then why did you do it? What was the benefit? What was the benefit to build up your paradise here? It happened... By the way, I'm about to wrap this up, so get ready. It happened a number of years ago. I was on a radio show. They called me, and I did it over the telephone with them. And on the radio show, I mentioned this hadith and gave some explanation about it. 
Afterwards, they had people calling in. And one lady, she called in. She said, I agree with everything you said. It was wonderful. It was great, except one thing. She said, you were talking about the people in prison. She says, I don't think people should be put in prison. I said, what? I mean, I'm working with prisoners. I know they need to be there. Trust me. <laughs> they need to be there. Some of them, <laughs> they need to be separated from each other. They're very dangerous people, some of them. Some. Subhanallah. And she said, oh, I don't think anybody should go to prison. I said, really? She said, yes. I think they should be taken to some place like an island that has nice, beautiful flowers, trees, birds, rivers, and gardens. And then they could change. I said, ma'am, you're describing Jannah. This is what Allah describes a reward for the people that are the believers, amanu wa amilu salihat, those who believe and do the good works, the righteous deeds. You should reward these people for being criminals? Allah Akbar. And subhanallah. And that's when it came in my mind. Look, that's exactly what the Prophet said. She was, by the way, she wasn't Muslim. The point was, and I still see this so clear today, if you want your paradise here, go ahead. But what will you have on the day of judgment? But if you want your paradise on the day of judgment, then what are you willing to sacrifice here? And think about it. Because today, more than ever before, we need the right kind of media. We have to have the real voice of real Islam. Somebody has to stand up and say what La ilaha illallah really means and the benefit it is for Muslims and non-Muslims. I'm going to wrap it up right there and open up the chance. I think we have some folks want to ask some questions. They said give some time for that. I would like to ask you whenever we come to the question part of it, be sure to ask questions. I know the answer to it makes me look smart. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Back to you. Thank you very much, Fadid Sheikh, for this precious and useful speech uh, to all of us, inshallah. And uh, we would like to open the chance for questions, but uh, I think we can give the priority to non-Muslims to ask some questions. Well, let me do this. Let me do a quick inventory. Is anybody here that's a Muslim? Raise your hand. All the Muslims, put your hand up. Quick. Now put the other one up. Okay, get used to it. That's airport security. Okay. Now, anybody that's not Muslim, just put up one hand. Anybody not Muslim? Who else? Where? How you like being surrounded by all these ter um, <coughs> Muslims? Alhamdulillah. Almost slipped, didn't I? Anyhow, what we would like to do is give you guys a chance. If you have any question, even a comment, something you'd like to say, you're most welcome. And maybe we can get them to bring a, a, a microphone over to you. Here we go. You sure? How about that, that charming lady sitting with you? Why don't you let her say, huh? Where, okay, tell us this. Where are you from? Where are you from? We're from Namibia. From? Namibia. Very close to South Africa. Oh, okay. I'm sure that you have some comment about being here and visiting here in... Dubai, and uh, maybe you'd like to say something good or bad. It doesn't matter. It's your chance. You got the mic. Talk to us. What do you think about being here? How do you like it? Uh, I think uh, we were here or are here by invitation, and uh, it's a very interesting e evening. Uh, listening to the thoughts and uh, the ideas that has been exchanged, and it's a learning lesson. How do you like being here in Dubai? Well, I'm actually from Abu Dhabi, but uh, yeah, it's a beautiful country. It's, oh, uh, did people you have to have a visa beautiful. to get here from Abu Dhabi? Yeah, I just came up. You need across. a visa? <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. MashaAllah. Anybody else is not Muslim would like to ask any question, you're welcome. We'll give preference to anybody who is not Muslim, especially if you're thinking about being a Muslim and you have a question about Islam. And after that, if we have any of our sisters that have a question or something, we'll give them the next priority. Any of our sisters have something? 
I'm trying to avoid actually getting into these guys because they give me a hard question I don't know the answer to. <laughs> okay, gentlemen, questions. I know you got one. Right here. Microphone is coming. Yeah, there you go. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam rahmatullah. Ramadan Mubarak. Thank Tell you. us your name. For you also, Tell us your name. Abdurrahman. Abdurrahman. Minayn. Where are you from? I'm uh, Jordanian. Jordanian. Urdan. Yes, Urdan. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, from your experience, what the difference between the uh, Islamophobia phenomena in Europe and in the United States according to the reasons of this phenomenon? Do you think the same reasons in Europe, is it the same in the United States or it's different reasons? The question our brother is having, Abdurrahman Jazakallah khair, um, the question is regarding the difference between the way the Europeans consider Islam and those in, a, in America. Now America, by the way, includes all of America, which is South America, Central America, Mexico, United States, and Canada. Just for the benefit of our viewers who might not know that. Also, Europe is a, a combination of many countries. And I haven't actually visited all of them yet, but I'm ready to go, you know. And from what little bit I might know about the subject is that in some ways there are similarities of the reason for this fear, an unnatural fear in English language is called a phobia. Somebody who has an unrealistic fear of something. It's not rational. That's a phobia. And so I consider that to be an appropriate terminology, Islamophobia. Because Islam should not be the thing they're afraid of. By the way, I'm afraid of some Muslims. I am myself, and you should be too. Some of them are weird. No doubt. But don't be afraid about Islam. Why? And this is where I do the etymology of the word. Let's discover what is Islam. Islam is from a verb in the Arabia, Islama, coming from the root silm, seen, bam, me. And there's nothing dangerous or bad in this word at all. It's very beautiful. In the final form, in Islam, it contains many meanings in English that have to be present all at the same time. These are not options. These are all part of the same package. Hmm? Like if you have the ingredients to make a cake, you can't separate them out. They all have to be there. You don't get a cake. Number one, surrender. Number two, submit. Number three, obey. Number four, sincerity. Number five, peace. And then all of these have a particular way they have to be blended, just like the cake. First of all, you surrender to Allah. You submit to His law, the Sharia. Then you obey what you said you would do. When you made your shahada, you, you are committing yourself to do something. You have to do that. And number four, look at this, it has to be sincere. Sincere. Now, everybody know the word sincere? You know the word sincere. Can you force somebody to be sincere? If it's force, it's not sincere. Go look it up in the dictionary. If I force somebody, it's not sincere. If it's sincere, it's from the heart. So it's impossible for Islam to be spread by a sword or any other force. And number five, peace. Many times I hear Muslims say, Islam is peace. They're not totally wrong, but they're not totally right either. Because the word for peace is not Islam. We don't say to each other, Islam alaikum, do we? And we say, Salam Alaikum. It's very similar, but what's the difference? Because this peace that's in Islam is the peace between you and the one you submitted to, which is Allah. So it describes your relationship. Aslama is your relationship with the Almighty. I want you to pay close attention, Muslims. Muslims pay attention. Because once you have this in your mind, I submit, surrender, Sincerely in peace to Allah. Whatever He gives me, I accept it. 
If, it's, if I like it, I'll say Alhamdulillah. If I don't like it, if it's difficult, I'll still make sabr. This is a hadith. Now, in this condition, what is the most logical, logical, logical thing you can think of? You put yourself in a position of a slave, yes or no? Abd. You became a slave. And you're admitting you have a master, yes or no? So what's the first thing you need now? More than anything else you need, you need to know what he wants you to do, yes or no? And in order to do that, you might think I'm going to say Quran. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'm telling you something, that if you don't have this, the Quran cannot help you. You need connection. Connection. Don't you need to know what he wants? Don't you need to hear what, 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 what's going on with this? What am I supposed to do? What do you want me to do? Connection. How do you say connection in Arabic? Silla. And what comes from this word? Salah. So what happens? If you want to enter into Islam, the first and foremost thing is what? Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, ashadu Muhammad Rasulullah. I submit and surrender myself to the concept that there is no other God to worship anywhere, anytime, any place except Allah. And I submit and surrender myself to the way and the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the final messenger in a long line of prophets and messengers that came from God. Yes or no? And immediately after that I need what? And what is in the second pillar of Islam? Connection! It's not a punishment. It's not a difficulty. It's what you need. You've got to have it more than you need food, more than you need water. Wallahi, more than you need air, you need this connection. And then after that is zakat. The wealth that we have, the money that we have, the rizq that Allah gave us, what are we doing with this? Doesn't it have a problem? All wealth in this world has a problem. Let's clean it. Clean it. What's the word in Arabic for cleaning something, purifying it? Zakat. Zakat. Use this word. Zakat. You want to clean it? Take two and a half percent of the wealth that you hold not your income tax. No, we don't have that in Islam. Two and a half percent of the wealth from the wealthy people and give it to the poor people. Then Allah will clean your money for you and make it grow. Yes or no? If the Muslims would wake up to this one factor, there wouldn't be a poor person left on the earth. But we have a problem. It's called bakil. Bakil. Stingy. Scared. <laughs> I only have two billion dollars. You know? If I spend one of them, well, I'll only have one left. What? Islam taught us if you got enough food for one day, that's sufficient. Islam taught us if you had two rooms in the house, that's sufficient. A third room for a guest, then what? Anything after that's for the shaitan, the devil. Wow. What happened to the Muslims? Now do you wonder why we're in a bad problem? We don't follow our deen. We're telling everybody else, Islam is this, Islam is low, it's low. Well, excuse me, I heard you, I don't see you. This is a problem. You got to talk, where's the walk? So this we've got to work on. Good question, brother, thank you. And who else have a question? I scared them, they don't want to ask another question after that one. Alhamdulillah. We have one of our brothers here, mashallah. If you guys can pass the mic over to him, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, where, um, what's your name? Imad. Imad. Uh, move your head over a little bit. Ah, there we go. Now I Im can see. My name is Imad. Iman? Imad. Ah, Im uh, Imad. Yeah. Ah, uh, Imad. So, uh, where are you from? Uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Yeah. Uh, Colombo, Candy? Uh, um, between. In between? Yeah. The area in between is near the Elephant Orphanage. Maybe. Have you been there? No. You don't know where it is? Nope. The next time you go, I'll take the show to you. Alright. Uh, yeah, I'm serious. I've been there. It was you, very nice. You pay for the flight ticket, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> What's your question, Imad? Uh, I wanted to ask. What's the easiest way to confront someone when you want to give them dawah? Like when you when you want to 
bring up the subject of Islam to a non-Muslim, how do you, how do you start, like, without offending them? How do you ease it in? You know, I asked myself that same question, and I wanted to know what's the answer. And in the beginning, I saw some videos about debating with people, you know, attacking their Bible, attacking their beliefs, attacking the Hindu beliefs, attacking the Christian beliefs, etc., etc. It didn't work. In fact, it turned people against me and against what I'm trying to do. Then I learned something about something called Sira, Sira of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the biography of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his way, his manners, his akhlaq, his behavior. And from that I found, wow, let me try that and see if it works. Let me act like a true Muslim. And I was surprised that right away Allah brought people to me who would ask me questions. Rather than me go to them, Allah would send them to me. And then suddenly I saw people entering Islam. And in the beginning, when I first married my wife, she was actually getting more people into Islam than me. How is because she's wearing this cover. And people would come up to her and say, uh, why do you wear that? I mean, we're living in Texas for crying out loud. Why are you dressed like this with black all over you like that? I mean, you know, it's, and your face is covered up. Maybe, you know, you're something wrong she did. somebody asked her one time why you have this face mask she said I don't have any lips <laughs> try to say lips without using your lips you can't alhamdulillah but anyhow you know the, the thing about it is though when you are living the life of a true Muslim you are already giving the call the dawah because people see you a real Muslim is confident in himself and what he's doing. A true Muslim, she's covering herself properly and she's standing out very clearly. This person believes in their religion. And when you establish the Salah, wherever you are, it's time to pray, you do your Salah. And that's happened to me. Me and my daughters, one time we stopped to pray somewhere. Some people came and stood and they waited. And when we got done, they want to ask us a bunch of questions. In a market one time, a brother and I were praying, a Turkish brother, we were praying. Afterwards, they come and they ask us, why do you move your finger? Of all the questions, they just want to know, why did we move our finger? Something like this. And then we opened the story and we began explaining what's Islam. Just like I just told you. The basic of the word itself. And subhanAllah, they many times they say, can I get a book? Can I get some more information? And I usually carry some things with me to give to them. And subhanAllah, after we now we have 2200 websites and then any subject of Islam you want I can give you the website you can go there and take care of it but even without that when people see you living breathing and acting as a true believer they will be interested the companions of Muhammad peace be upon him they were successful in this life not meaning about money although some of them were very rich and you know that but they were more successful in that they were happy and confident with whatever came. The rest of the people are miserable. They don't know, why did this happen to me? How come somebody got cancer? Oh, somebody died. Oh, why this? Why? Why? You know, we talk about it. Not a Muslim. He says, Alhamdulillah, Kuliha. Alhamdulillah, MashaAllah. That's it. So they begin thinking, what is it about these people? Why are they confident? Why are they so happy? Even when disaster comes, like the tsunami, when the tsunami came, I don't know if you know this, I happened to be in Chennai, India when that happened. So I got to see the aftermath of it. And what happened when the Muslims went to those islands and carried help to them, you know what it was that the people wanted more than anything else? They came, they brought clothing, they brought food, they brought many things to them. You know what the people said? The most important thing you brought? Yourself. We just wanted contact. We wanted to see that the rest of the world was still there. And we're happy. Alhamdulillah, you came to see us. That's enough for us. And some people entered Islam. Now you'll imagine this. So this is what the focus should be in life. To be and live your life as a Muslim. Then, when people ask you a question, yes, it's important to know the answers to questions. But don't think of yourself as going in the street, right? With a banner that said, be a Muslim or go to hell. Don't think like that. It's obvious enough after somebody knows the real message of what we're talking about. If you don't want to believe in God, that's your choice. It is. There is no compulsion in this way of Islam. But it's their choice. They're making it. All you have to do is show them what the choice is.
then after that you're supposed to leave them alone with that that's what happened to me the one who actually gave me dawah for three months working with me when I got to the point and I asked him that serious question he gave me the most serious answer I ever heard and after that he just walked off and left me to go make on my own decision would you like to know what he said well we'll do that right after this commercial we'll be back oh no that's not <laughs> Alhamdulillah. What happened was, he said to me, because I was trying to convert him to be a Christian, okay? What you're talking about, giving people dawah for Christianity, that's what I'm doing, okay? So you should be a Christian or you're going to go to hell, you know? All right. For three months, he put up with that. Finally, he told me, you know, Islam teaches us to always go to something that is better. Whatever is better, you should go to it. This is Islam. This is a very important part of Islam. Whatever is better, go to it. So if your religion is better than my religion, I will go to it. When he said that, I said, Got him! We got him! Because in Christianity, you do not have to pray five times a day. You do not have to fast Ramadan. You do not have to pay zakat. You do not have to say any kind of special shahada like, you know, and you don't have to know Arabic, you don't have to read the Quran, you don't have to do Hajj, so many things you don't have to do. So we got him. He said, if it's better. I was smiling, I was thinking, man, we want to fill up the bathtub, you know, push him down in the water, baptize him tonight, yeah. Then he said, but you need proof. I said, what? He said, you need proof. Proof? And I said to him, hey man, religion is not about proof, it's about faith. He said in Islam we have both. We have faith, but we have proof to back it up. He said, what? You mean to sit there and tell me as a Muslim that you can prove that there's God? He said, you mean to sit there and tell me as a preacher for Christianity that you can't? Huh? And then after he began talking about some of the most beautiful things that we take for granted every day, the proof, the clear proof, without even referring to Quran, without referring to Hadith, the clear proof in front of everybody's eyes points to the fact that there is only one God one God for one creation and one way and all you have to do is talk to him and look what he said to me he said now no longer is this a conversation between you and me or you and your father my father was ordained minister businessman we worked together lived together long story he said it's not between you and your wife or you and your congregation or your associates your colleagues this is something between you and him. Go talk to him. Sit up. Connection. You see what he did? He planted the seed, didn't he? And he left me. You know what I did? I was, at first I was confused. Like, what happened? What just happened? A minute ago, I'm ready to put him in the bathtub. And now here I am. And I'm realizing he's right. So I found a place behind my father's house. Nobody can see me. Okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to look for that same direction. I saw this Muslim five times a day, every day. I witnessed him doing Salah. So let me put my head on the ground. I don't know how to do all the stuff he did, but I know putting my head on the ground, that's good stuff. That's good. You know why? When you put your head on your ground to your Lord, you lowered yourself to the lowest way you could be. A baby could kick you and you can't do anything. But you raised yourself up in front of him. And I did that. I put my head on the ground. And then I asked Allah kind of, you know, in my head, I was thinking, God, if you hear me, guide me. I had no idea Edina Surat al at that time. 21 years ago, I didn't know any Arabic. I didn't even know what's Allah Akbar. But I said that in English guide me what do we say every day 17 times a day 
in all of our prayers Ehdina Ehdina Surat Mustaqim SubhanAllah when I raised up my head I knew I knew there's no doubt in my mind that I have to do what he wants me to do this might be my only chance in fact I had a strange feeling this could be my last chance you better grab it and go with it and I grabbed tight and I held on tight and for the next year year and a half you can't believe all the ups and downs the things that I went through sometime I would think why this have to happen like this but it was all to teach me to help me to understand and subhanallah today when I look back all I say alhamdulillah praise be to Allah for this because now when I talk to the new Muslims I can really help them and get them through the difficult times Allah promises this in the Quran the opposite of what most people will tell you you go to some religion they'll tell you yeah come to our religion it's gonna be easy we promise you paradise come on guys come on in everybody's going to paradise yeah that's what everybody says Islam doesn't promise you that in fact if you want to come to Islam I can promise you hell that's easy you screw up or if now the conditions come if you make tawbah if you praise the law if uh, you got a lot of ifs then you can go to paradise so we don't promise anybody anything oh and the clergy there's another thing the clergy in any religion these are the highest people in paradise isn't that true yes every religion oh this guy he's a priest he's a you know a temple guard or he's the bishop or he's minister yeah he's a high oh he's going to be big in the paradise yeah our prophet sallallahu said allah subhanahu wa ta'ala god almighty will start the fire of hell nor jahannam he'll start the fire of hell with the scholars of islam huh who preached it but didn't follow it the munafiqeen the hypocrites when I tell the Christians that they go really yes we know full well what this is the reality it's not a joke man it's not something you can just make up what you like this is reality and Allah said in the Quran in chapter 29 this is Surah Ankabut it means the spider Alif Lam Mim then he says what means in English do the people think they're going to be left alone just because they said I believe in Allah oh no and that they won't be put into a great fitna calamity oh no just like the people before them by the way the early Christians suffered a lot they were tortured they were cut in half the Prophet Sassam told us they had their skin raked off with steel combs man just because they believe one God and that Jesus was the messenger of God subhanallah look at this and here it says why why to show who are the truthful and those who are the liars may Allah make us of the truthful may Allah make us of the people that appreciate this deen May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who practice it and call to what we practice. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. So, any other question? We got another question right back over here. We got a live one. Let's see. What? You already gave away your microphone? <laughs> Too bad. All right, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Brother, what's your name? Imad Uddin. What? Imad Uddin. Uh, another Imad, what is this? You guys can put in some kind of deal here. Imad Adin, yeah. where are you from? India. Okay, at least you didn't say Sri Lanka, that's all right. <laughs> where in India? Hyderabad, it's uh, very close to I Sri know Hyderabad where Hyderabad is. It's South India. We don't need a geography lesson, we just want to know where you're from. <laughs> Thank you anyway. No, go ahead. <laughs> What's your question? Uh, actually, I'm an IT professional, so my question is related to internet, uh, especially Facebook. Uh, most of the videos and images uh, on Facebook are uh, coming about the brutal killing of uh, Muslims around the world. For example, in Burma, in Assam, 
or some other Arab countries. So those, uh, after seeing those images, uh, it's like we are feeling that uh, we are helpless. So people, most of the users on Facebook, they just uh, share these images without knowledge, like burn bodies and the uh, pieces of bodies, images and videos. So why why this is happening? Like why they are uh, without information? They are sharing these images and making us feel that we are helpless. And we know that uh, all the time we have help from Allah. So this Facebook mufti is, I should say. And one more question. Uh, oh, one sorry, is going on. we don't have two for one tonight. But that was, that was very nice. Okay. We'll get the, give them the mic back. This, seriously, uh, we do have others that have questions. So I'm going to take that question first. Uh, the, another question related to that. They asked me one time, Chef, Facebook, it has haram pictures in there. It has haram stories. It has a lot of stuff. So Facebook, is it haram? I said, okay, you want the answer to that from me? It's on my Facebook account. <laughs> Actually, Islam teaches us something amazing. It teaches us that sometimes you have to make a choice between something bad and something worse. And actually there's a lot of bad things on Facebook, there's no doubt about it. But at the same time, because we know so many people use it, it's important for us to present the right answers, the right way of what's Islam. Is that Isa? Salam alaikum. I know this brother very well on Facebook, right there. Put your hand up. Salam alaikum. MashaAllah. All right. So, yes, you're right about the thing that you see on there. And there, it's unfortunate that we do have some people who are making things look helpless and hopeless. But actually, that's against the teaching of Islam. A Muslim is between two things. This is what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught us. We're always between two things. We're between a hope of the reward of paradise and a fear of the hellfire. That's our hope and that's our fear in this life. Nothing else. Everything else that's happening in this life is a scenario that will pass. It will all pass. But the reality is what happens after you die. And this is what we should be concerned about. And those people who are giving these strange answers and these weird uh, responses on Facebook, and Twitter, emails, text messages, and I've seen a lot of that. I, I make dua for them. That will guide them. But just so you know, not all of them are really Muslim. Okay, uh, We received a text message this morning that was going around. I don't know if you know about it. It came on the cell phone this morning. Usually it used to come in emails. But today it came in a text message, which was very long. I was surprised to see it in a text message. And it went out to many, many people and telling them that the Prophet, peace be upon him, promises you a reward if you'll forward it on to other people. Huh? What? He promised you if you forwarded it on your cell phone, you're going to... What kind of lie is that? And it's talking about the dream of Sheikh Ahmed in Medina. How many of you heard about the Sheikh Ahmed dream? You heard about it? You know what I'm talking about? I heard about it when I first became Muslim. When did you hear about it? Twenty? Yeah, many years ago. And then again, and it recycles again and again that it's supposed to be Sheikh Ahmed in Medina has a dream. And in the dream, the Prophet Sassam comes to him and says, some people they don't pray, and some people this and this, and blah, 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 and you have to do this and this, and if you don't forward it, you know, the whole world will crash on you. And I'm, I'm serious, it was really weird. The first time I saw it, immediately I called the Sheikh and asked him, and he said, there is nobody named Sheikh Ahmed in Medina. And nobody has a dream like that and publishes these kind of strange things that you're saying. And for sure, there's nothing going to happen to you for forwarding it except ithum. Because it's sin to lie about the Prophet Wasallam. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, about the one who lies on him, 
to reserve his seat in the hellfire. So it is a big bona fide lie, a huge lie. And uh, I wrote a story about this over 10 years ago, and you can find it on our website called IslamNewsroom.com. In fact, I made it the feature story for today. I revived this story. I can do that, by the way. Not like you guys, the reporters. We've got some reporters here. You know how hard it is to come up with new stuff all the time? I just go through the old stuff and put a new date on it. See? Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Because Islam is timeless. It's for all times. Zakalak here, good question. But now let's come to our brother, I guess, over here. Ask us a little while ago. We'll be back with you, Mount Allah, if we get time, but we're going to take this question. Okay, brother? First of all, Salaam Alaikum. Welcome, and inshallah, we're happy to have you with us. And tell us your name. Muhammad Atallah. Muhammad, where are you from? Egypt. Masri? Yeah. Saidi? La la. La? No, from Cairo. If you recall, oh, it, we invited I'm you. I'm going to Cairo, by the way. We should tell everybody, I'm going to Cairo, inshallah ta'ala, on Saturday, inshallah. inshallah. And I'm going to be there for about four or five days. We're going to have Eid there. Inshallah. You want to come have Eid with us? I will be there. Oh, everybody want to go? <laughs> huh? Well, let's go. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. If you recall, Sheikh, we invited you to uh, Hong Kong in 2010, uh, serving Islam team. So, you were there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know why El? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, he's from Egypt. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Wael Ibrahim. Yeah. He's, we love uh, these guys. Yeah, Their team is called Serving Islam. And they do. They do a beautiful job. They have all those ladies that come there, Philippines and stuff, yeah. to help give them the dawah. MashaAllah. And they can marry four wives. Go ahead, what's your question? <laughs> Sorry, my question is. Uh, <laughs> my question is related to Ramadan. Uh, alhamdulillah, every Ramadan, we all feel the boost of iman, and we feel that we want to change after Ramadan and to do so many things. But immediately after Ramadan, that curve goes down immediately. So, can you give us some advice on really how to avoid this trap uh, after Ramadan, and what exactly can we do so we can fulfill those goals and targets that we want to achieve? Muhammad, you asked a very, very good question but you asked the wrong person I'm one of those people just like you that after the last day of Ramadan I feel like <laughs> no we all we have to work on it it, it becomes a job you, can I share with you something that comes to my mind when the Prophet Islam told us that in the month of Ramadan Allah ties up the shaitan he doesn't kill him okay but he ties him up it restricts what he can do but then when it's over, he's loose again. Now don't you think he's sitting there like this going, Wait till I get loose. <laughs> and that's what he's doing. So when he gets loose, you can expect the problem. And this is what happens to all of us. These shayateen are running, the devils are running everywhere to give us a hard time. So I recommend for us to, to establish good things in Ramadan, such as Kiamaleo, such as visit to the masjid on a regular basis, such as getting up on time for Fajr, such as giving charity every day, not just the zakat, but a little something every day. Give something every day to somebody. Then, after Ramadan it finishes, don't shut it off and say, well, I'll start it up next year. No, no, try to continue that. Then it'll continue your closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah. Good question. Thank you for that question. May, uh, let's make dua, you and me, for each other that we'll be able to survive that. I think uh, we have another brother back here has a question. What happened to the microphone? You got it? He's right there. You don't get to keep it, brother. You got to share it. Okay, go ahead, brother. Salaam alaikum. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. My name is Abdul Rahim. Abdul Rahim? No. Where are you from? In fact, I, I'm from Australia now. Australia? The land yes. down under. Did you come up here on a kangaroo? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Now, uh, really it is not a question, it is rather an idea about this Islamophobia and what is going on about uh, Muslims and Islam nowadays. Actually, Islam and Muslims are victims of three uh, types at this time. One is uh, the media, and the other is uh, uh, the politicians. 
Yeah, put the mic. Put these, he wants you to put the mic down because oh, right. it, it, we can't hear you. And okay. the other, the second is uh, politicians. Yes. The third is uh, the, the, uh, the third is the third is uh, uh, hypocrites. Hypocrites from, the, okay. from the Muslims themselves. Okay. Coming to media the, politicians in Munafikin. Okay. Uh, all three of them are Munafikin. And in fact, the media is dealing with uh, uh, for money, just lying about Muslims and Islam, and the politician is also to get the seat. He says all these uh, bad things about Islam mm -hmm. and Muslims. Mm -hmm. So, what shall we do now, or what is the best way to fight this? such three people. Abdurrahim, I thank you for that question. That was a good question and you brought me back to my subject and gave me a chance to open the platform for my sales pitch. I am selling the idea to Muslims everywhere how important it is for us to have a voice. And you mentioned clearly exactly in the right order. The media today is media for money. Money media, news for falus. And you're right. Number two, you mentioned the politicians, and I tell you I'm from Texas, and in Texas we have the best politicians money can buy. This is the part where you start laughing, guys. All right, wake up. I know you're tired. It's Ramadan. Come on. The best politicians money can buy. Much better. It's on the soundtrack, when you kick it up, it will be fine. Anyhow. And the third, you mentioned amongst the Muslims themselves. We have some Muslims today, I don't know where their head is. I have no clue where their mind is. That they start compromising Islam to please non-Muslims. To the extent that when they get done, they've watered our deen down worse than what the Christians did to Jesus, peace be upon him. Unbelievable things that I've watched happen in my country to the extent I go, are you sure you're still a Muslim? What happened? How? We open up a dialogue. I like that. We open up the doors to the masjid. I love that. We invite the Christians in. This is what we should do. We go to their place. No problem. And we shake hands and we're good with them and they're good with us. We want to open a communication line. I absolutely agree with it. But then they start talking about, well, you know, why don't we let them worship Allah on one day and then we can go and worship Jesus with them on another day. You're like, what? What? What are you talking about? Because if you follow any of their religion, then you are following their way. Hello? Where's your Islam? Because I want to call your attention, and you already know this, I'll call your attention to what happened to Prophet Muhammad wasallam. The Qurayshi tribe was worried because some people were following Muhammad now. And they were scared, you know, this is going to cause a problem. We don't want to have to kill our own relatives. We're going to have a war. We can see because we're going to worship these idols and statues and they want us to dump that and go over here and worship God without anything in between. So what happened? They offered him a, a compromise. Why don't we do this, you know? You worship our gods a lot and Uzzah and Manat. These are some of the gods that they had. You worship our gods for one year. And then we'll worship your Allah, like you would do, for one year. And before Prophet Sallallahu can say a word, he didn't say any word from himself. Allah put the words into his mouth. Qul ya ayyuhal kafirun, la abudu ma tabadun. Here is when it comes, when Allah tells Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Qul, say this to this kafir, say this to this disbeliever. Yo, you disbeliever, I don't worship what you worship. And you don't worship what I worship. I'm not going to worship what you worship, and you're not going to worship what I worship. Lekum dinakum waliyadin. To you, your way, <laughs> and to me, my way. And do you know, this is a problem for us today. Because of what? Why are those Muslims in that condition? Why do these politicians get away with what they do? And why is that media out here doing what they do? And it's just nothing but news for bucks. And we know that. Why? And I'm going to tell you, brother, Abdurrahim, 
you and me, were the problem. Because we have not stood together, held hands together, and stood firmly in front of everybody, God and everybody, and just say, you know what, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And be steadfast on what we said. The Prophet ﷺ, I'm going to end with this. The Prophet ﷺ, he gave us the best advice that anybody ever gave. And he was asked in a strange way. Somebody went to him and they said, Ya Rasulullah, give us advice. Give us something of your knowledge that nobody else could give us. Now, if you ask a mufti today, a scholar today, he's going to give you a library. You're going to get a whole bunch huh, of books. Am I right or wrong? Volumes. He's going to say, give me a few weeks, we'll make up a thesis, right? But look what he said. Pull a month of the law. Thummastafi. That's it. Simple. Beautiful to the point. And this is good for us even today. Say. I believe in Allah. Then stay steadfast on what you said. And may Allah keep us steadfast on La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Ameen. May Allah make us of those people who know, understand, and practice this deen the way it's supposed to be practiced. Ameen. Allah bless you and your family and all of you and your families in this blessed month, this month of Ramadan. And I'm going to throw it out there. Here comes the commercial. Are you ready? And get guided with Guide Us TV. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good job. Good job. Finally, I would like to express my thanks to Fadilat Sheikh Yusuf Estes for the vital lecture he has delivered to us. And thanks is also in order the Dubai International Holy Quran Award for all the efforts they are undertaking for the benefit of Islam. And we would like to uh, remind you that tomorrow, inshallah, Sheikh Yusuf will be delivering a speech after Jum'ah prayer in Sheikh Hamdan Mosque in Garhud. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.